So welcome everybody to the first Community Board 2 meeting for 2021. Glad that so many familiar faces made it through 2020. And it's good to see everybody as we kick off the new year. Depending on your lens, I think anybody who made it through December 31st, 2020 has a lot to be thankful for. So that's, that's the lens I'm working from. And I'm excited for what 2020 will, will bring. And so with that, I welcome everyone. Um, those who are accustomed to have joined our meetings before through virtual, um, you know I like to run a tight, quick meeting. I am going to stick to the agenda. In spite of me saying I want it to be quick, it's not to rush anyone, but know that I will move you along if I need to, okay? That being said, um, has everyone had a chance to review the agenda? If so, are there any edits that we need to make to the agenda? Fantastic. Um, I've already done the welcome. I already walked you through the meeting protocols. I would remind everyone that the meetings are being recorded. And so not that I need you to, to change your behavior. It's just a reminder that anything you say will you know, be recorded and people can view it um, at a later date. I'd also remind everyone that if you have questions or if there are things you want to acknowledge throughout the meeting, please feel free to use the chat. My colleagues are on the line as well, and they will go through the chat and either respond to you or communicate to me about things that I need to, that need to be called to my attention. And so in advance, I want to thank the colleagues um, in the district office for um, making sure that we use as much technology to be efficient and communicate as we always have in the past. And so let me thank them in advance. With that, um, the next item on the agenda is the introduction of the board members. There are way too many board members for me to do that. So just consider that a nod and it's done. Let's move to item number three. I've already done that because I asked for approval on the agenda. Let's move to item number four. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes from December 2020? I see some head nods, that's great. Are there any edits to the minutes from December 2020? Jessica, that's the hats off to you because no one has any edits, which is fantastic. I'm looking item at Barbara. Five, okay. Your person's report. <laughs> Item number five on the agenda is the chairperson's report. Let's see, where do I start? Uh, let's have about the fact that our district manager of 17 years has decided to retire. I'm not sure if I've communicated that to the entire board verbally or face-to-face, -face, but I did send out an email. I wanna take this moment to again, acknowledge and thank Mr. Perez for his 17 years of service um, with the community board. He's done an excellent job in his time with the board. And so, like I've said to the, the colleagues and the rest of the team that run the district office, um, Rob is now um, in our rearview mirror. We wish him the very best. We wish his family the very best. And we hope that whatever his future endeavors are, that he succeeds at them and that he's happy and healthy. Now that we pivot, what I want to communicate to everyone is that, um, as I've said in the past, and I will continue to say, the board office is for doing an outstanding job. They are working efficiently, and I want to take this opportunity to single out Carol Ann, Taya, and Gustavo. Um, hopefully, you have not witnessed any significant gap during the transition, because I have not. And I think it's worth thanking the staff for all the work that they're doing um, and doing all of this remotely, I might add. So they're not working in the office, they're working remotely, but they're doing a fine job. And so I'm gonna be thankful to them for the work that they've performed. So with that, you get a virtual hand clap for the work that you're doing in the office. And so I appreciate you for all of that. So George, we have me figure this out. So thank you, George. I appreciate you doing that with your red headphones. That's really cool. But um, I'm, I'm really pleased with the work that the office is doing. Related to that, the Finance and Personnel Committee, as you all have heard me say on multiple occasions, is really the de facto human resource office by the structure outlined through our bylaws. And so the F&P Committee has begun to meet 
and outline what the needed steps are for um, creating a job vacancy notice and just tying up some of the loose ends. For those of you who are uh, adaptly familiar with our bylaws, there are several requirements of the bylaws which we need to adhere to. And the process to do that is already underway. At a later date, I will communicate to everyone um, the next steps that are required per the bylaws so we can begin the actual process of um, posting a notice for the district manager and the process to interview applicants and potential candidates. So more to come there. Um, let, me, let me just pause for a minute because that is a significant topic. I don't want to just brush through that. And so if there are any questions, I'll, I'll reserve the time now for board members. Let me repeat, for board members to ask questions on anything that I've mentioned thus far. Okay, that's great. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, we are proceeding in a very expeditious fashion so that we kick off our new platform for um, to use of technology through all platforms and through our website. Again, the office has done a tremendous job there and uh, Taya has really led that effort. And so in a very near future, you will see the results of the work that's being done. And I also want to thank the board members who volunteered their time to serve on what I'm calling an ad hoc technology committee, if you will, to help ensure that we have completeness around the way in which we are producing information and hopefully the way in which we will continue to communicate with the members of community board two and all the individuals we serve within our catchment area. With that, I'm going to transition now. And at this time, I'd like to turn this over. I think I'm turning this over to Carol Ann. But Carol Ann, if I'm not turning this over to you, you just shake your head or tell me something or keep smiling, which is good. Um, we're going to present the first, for the first time, what we're now renaming as the district office report and give everyone a chance to um, review those updates. So, Carol Ann, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Lenny. Good night, everyone. And hello. Happy New Year again. Um, we're launching our new district office report. It essentially gives the work that all of us do in the office. And in future months, we hope it will include the reports of our board members who sit on various committees and boards throughout the district representing CB2. Um, I'll keep it really short. We will place this uh, document in the board drive so all board members can access it. Uh, essentially, it gives a snapshot of the work that we're doing, like I said. So constituent inquiries, we've listed quite a few of them that have ranged from complaints about after hours variances uh, to um, Zoom links for other agencies, uh, community meetings, um, Parking and bike lanes, theft of packages in in Borum Hill. Um, we also have on there a complaint that's been ongoing since 2017, that of what's called a zombie property, which that's what HPD calls it. It means that it is a property that has been long vacant. The deed might be in dispute. And it's usually unmaintained. In this case, this particular property is causing damage to the adjoining properties. And currently, we're working with the Department of Finance at this stage to see if they can um, start attempting to collect the uh, fines, which at this point are above $100,000. Um, and then more regular stuff like why is there no parking sign on my block? Um, and then we have constituent outreach. Uh, Taya really heads up this section. Um, and again, there's a link to all the details on that, but all those notices that you get about our meetings um, and community events, that's what comes under uh, constituent outreach. And again, all that information that we do is available through the public drive. 
Also included um, is a section on district meetings and notes. And those are meetings that we attend as members of advisory bodies. Um, and there are a couple of notes there on COVID vaccine um, distribution. Uh, the DOE uh, diversity and uh, inclusion planning meetings. Mm -hmm. One last week was to discuss the change in admission policies. Uh, if anyone has children in school, this would be really interesting reading for you. Um, last night there was a meeting on envisioning a new or a, a new now shall we say Kyla Gore Park community meeting and then there was also the in staff uh borough service cabinet meeting which was held yesterday um really um critical to note for property owners is that the department of finance is currently sending out property tax assessment notices and please visit their website to think, see about exemptions if there's information you need to have about your taxes, they're holding online sessions, virtual online sessions. So please take advantage of that. Also presenting was the mayor's office of media and entertainment um, for our neighborhoods that may feel sometimes burdened or put upon by film shoots. Know that the office is amending policies to reduce that feeling in terms of parking, um, the way that um, you know, that now they, they're encouraging them, they're strongly encouraging them to use local restaurants to support the community in which they're working. And uh, staff priorities, like, you know, we keep the wheels turning and sometimes we may look like swans. Um, I don't know if you know what that means, but we might be gliding on the surface, but sometimes we're like paddling really quickly, but we keep it going. Um, and, you know, there's the, overall administration of the office where we all assist and this month's been a little bit tough with Rob leaving um, because we have had to uh, realign the workload to keep it all going but everything is moving along we're processing all applications SLA applications LPC applications um, we're continuing to administer our committees um, we're meeting with our committee chairs, setting agendas, and just doing the work that keeps the board going. Any questions? I have to say this is John Dew. Uh, Ms. Church, this is by far, I mean, I have a big Kool-Aid smile on my face. This is a phenomenal report. This report is what community board is all about. And I want to thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. It's a staff, it's a staff effort. <laughs> so we're happy to hear that. Thank you. I'd like to say something. I would like to congratulate the three of you that's holding things down. You're doing a phenomenal job. Congratulations. Thank you. So once again, I hope everyone realizes that what, what, what we're doing or what I've, what I've hoped you'll see from my desire to want to change the report is that it gives you a lens to what is actually happening in the office and really a little bit less about paragraph upon paragraph about meetings and things that take place in the community. I think there's a, there's a striking balance between the two. And so hopefully this report and this change of format gives you that insight um, and, and, you know, you start to have for those who may not have a great appreciation for the work that gets done in the office. Um, related to that, as we make the transition now and we start to um, do more about the equity of community involvement, as you may or may not know, there are several committees, whether it is the local bids, different stakeholder organizations that are, that have set aside a seat for the chair the district manager or a representation from CB2. What I'd like to do as we move forward is I'm working with the office to determine which of those seats require representation from the board office, either in the form of um, Carol Ann 
or Taya. Maybe not so much Gustavo because he's our, our part-time employee and, you know, his education is paramount. It's the first thing I want him to focus on. But, but with the exception of those type of seats, I'm looking for volunteers to raise their hand and maybe we can distribute throughout the community board since there's 50 of us to facilitate seats where you're representing community board too. Now, let me be really, really clear so that there's no ambiguity in my request. I'm looking for volunteers. Because you volunteer does not default you to be the representative. So volunteers, and then we'll go through a process of selecting the right candidates to represent us for those seats. Number two, if you are already part of an organization or a stakeholder group and you happen to be a representative community board too, let's know that you're representing as a member of the community, not a representative community board too. So even in the absence of maybe a familiar face, like the district manager, until we can come you know, get to a, a more stable approach, you still would be representing that as a stakeholder of the community, not by default, a representative community board too. So I want to make sure we just make that clear at the outset. Um, but I'm looking forward to more and getting better participation, sharing the wealth, so to speak, so that everyone can play a part. Um, and then last but not least, if you are going, if you are currently representing CB2 on the stakeholder organization, or in the future, you are selected to represent Community Board 2 in the same capacity. It is important, and I'm asking everyone, to please demonstrate some level of a report, because your report will then go in the district office report, right? To, to sit and represent Community Board 2 at the stakeholder groups and not bring that information back to the general body really causes a gap from an information perspective. It's important for all the members of Community Board 2 to recognize and be abreast of what's happening in the district. And so wherever we have representation, it's important that you provide that feedback. So um, just a reminder for people to do that. Next item on the agenda is item number seven. So I think everyone, if not everyone, many of you participated in a survey that Gustavo put together, um, and I found it quite interesting, at least for myself, when I reviewed the way the demographics are displayed of the community board and many of, the, of its members. And I, I found that information to be helpful, and I asked Gustavo if he would um, take a time tonight on the agenda to share that with everyone, go through his findings, and for those of you who find it interesting, um, we have, we'll set aside a moment to ask some questions but by all means, if you have deeper questions, please communicate that offline at the conclusion of his presentation, um, and hopefully you'll find it as interesting and informative as I did. So with that, Gustavo, I'm going to turn over to you to walk us through the findings of your uh, board demographic survey. And once again, job well done. Thank you, Mr. Singletary. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, I prepared um, a um, presentation um, that includes all of the findings from uh, the board demographic survey, and I'd like to share that with you all. Um, so, as you know, um, community board two is um, one of the most diverse uh, community boards in the city, and um, as someone who's working for, for such a diverse board, um, I'm really proud to, to be here amongst you all. Um, I want to first start with um, saying um, thank you. Thank you to everyone who participated in the survey. Um, I initially uh, designed a survey to increase um, uh, the transparency between community residents and the community board. And we had a surprising rate of uh, 87.75 uh, response rate, so that's that's really good. Um, we did have a, a, a small margin of error of 15%, um, and that's because we are a, a small board of 50 members. Um, so first off, to begin, um, you know we have uh, members represented, representing uh, the neighborhoods of community board community district two, um, and, and as you can see here, um, the, there's no. Um, overwhelming majority. Um, we do have some neighborhoods that are uh, 
represented more than others, but there's still some representation for each neighborhood. Um, I decided to take the time to kind of delineate um, the census tracts alienated with um, each neighborhood. Um, as you can see here, the bigger neighborhoods are uh, Brooklyn Heights, Cl uh, Clinton Hill, Barham Hill, and Fort Greene. Um, I did find some discrepancies, of course, um, with, um, so for example, downtown Brooklyn is overrepresented, um, being having 20% of board membership, while it's only 9% um, of the district. Um, same thing with, um, uh, and the reverse is, is true for Fort Greene, where only 12% of the uh, board is represented. Um, and it, it the neighborhood is occupies 20% of uh, of the district. Um, and so um, some of the key findings um, I include in every slide. Um, so for this one, um, the uh, the most significant interest of, of members in the district um, is residency. So people who live in the in the neighborhood or or more inclined to participate in in community board affairs. Um, followed by uh, members who work in the district, uh, um, and more, um, board members had the option to select more than one. So if they lived in in the neighborhood and also worked in the neighborhood, um, this accounts for uh, for those numbers. Um, there is a slight uh, female majority in in the board leadership, um, uh, board membership, and that's only by five percent. Um, uh, the uh, board uh, age composition is uh, slightly skewed to be more older. Um, as you can see here, um, uh, the age group, um, older age groups um, uh, occupy uh, a larger share of uh, board membership. Um, here you can see um, that board members um, occupy different um, housing types. Um, however, 25% of residents um, are house or apartment um, owners. Um, here you can see that uh, board members are um, have a higher um, education rate. Um, here, I, I really want to highlight this um, where I want to say that um, board members have a, a lot of, uh, have a really diverse background. Um, they don't come just from one sector, they come from all over and their experience is extremely valuable to the board. Um, and lastly here, um, I was asked by Mr. Singletary to um, ask um, retired members to kind of tell us what their previous experiences were. Um, and as you can see here, um, that is also very diverse. Um, and just like people who, who are currently in, in the um, workforce are work in all types of different sectors. And that's about it. So Gustavo, thank you again. Once again, I, I appreciate you um, doing this presentation. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm learning, Dorothy, I like this. So we're going to applaud you for the work that you've done. This, I, I, Like I said, I found it very informative. I've, or others felt the same. Um, let me take a minute to pause to see if there are any board members that have questions based on the information that Gustavo um, presented. Okay, Hasma? Yeah, could we use this um, information to perhaps solicit membership from the communities that are underrepresented? Well, so it's a great question, but Practically, I'm not sure how we do that in the sense that we don't really solicit participation from any communities, given that mm. most of the appointments come from three areas, through the borough president's office, the district, the councilmatic representation from the 35th and from the 33rd. And so it's a little bit, practically speaking, it'd be, it'd be a little bit challenging to direct that information. What we could do is communicate with the representatives from those, those councilmatic seats um, and see what their desire is one and then two like we've talked about at different times because you extend the invitation to an individual doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to accept for various reasons and so uh, i think the point that you're raising is one that speaks to us sharing the information so i'm glad gustavo was able to provide that information 
but practically how do we implement that still remains somewhat of a challenge. Well, I think we could first start to share it with the council members that are in areas that you're trying to solicit members from. The ones that That's cover the specific count um, councilmanic district. That let's say uh, one that jumps in um, in my head is like let's say um, Borum Hill doesn't have enough members underrepresented. Whoever is council member for Borum Hill or senator for Borum Hill, maybe you'll share it with them. So we're saying the same thing. Let me just simply say yes. We're, we're saying the same thing. Oh, I I got it. You're right. Okay. But I think we should use it in a positive way, especially now that we're renewing memberships. So again, I, I, I don't disagree. You're absolutely right. This is the first time we've done it. First time sure. we've had this information. So, you know, we'll have to work through how it becomes something that is a positive and not just an exercise. But let me simply say in, in short term, yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. Any Any other questions? I don't have any questions. I do have a oh, comment. So, John, if you don't about, have a question, hold it. If you, John, if you don't have a question, hold it. I want to get the questions first. I'm not looking for comments just yet. Hold on for me. Any other questions from anyone uh, who's a board member? Mr. Flannoy. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, just out of curiosity, when you have the census track, uh, does, does it give a number as far as population? Because I realize that in some cases, uh, there's been a density of population increases. Is that uh, included in this? Uh, no, not. I'll let Gustavo answer that. Go ahead, Gustavo. Uh, no, I didn't account for um, population density. I only accounted for um, designated uh, census tracts uh, attributed to each neighborhood. Any other questions? All right, so let me let me transition now to comments. Any comments, uh, Mr. Dew? I know you had a comment. Yes, um, I would just like to uh, first of all acknowledge that it is an excellent job that Mr. Gustavo has done for the community board. My comment is more along the lines of the age of our board members, uh, including myself. We tend to have an older group of board members. I think that's somewhat reflected in the delay we've had in keeping up with the changes in technology. We certainly are now heading in that direction with uh, a lot more speed than in the past. Uh, however, I'd just like to note that the way technology is changing, we really need to do a little bit better job in keeping up with it, like getting a Twitter account and other means of communicating with the larger district. Thanks, John. Agree uh, about the improvements to technology. So, I, you know, as stated in the outset, I think that's definitely on the way. And then um, just to also add to your point, those of us who feel like 25, um, we, we want to say thank you for acknowledging the younger committee uh, members. <laughs> Anybody else with a comment? All right, so let me make this last comment. For those of you who, who sit in districts that are based on the survey un underrepresented, feel comfortable that we're not getting rid of you. <laughs> Whoever we have is who we have, so every, everybody's safe. I think, as, as Hezra pointed out, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to share with the elected officials who represent um, our district and hopefully, you know, bring about additional thought to drill down to see how this can really be helpful to bring about greater diversity and equity to the boards, um, not so much from a, a gender and race perspective, but really from a location and a representation of the, the boundaries that cover the community board too. So Gustavo, again, great job. We appreciate that. Moving on to item number number nine, uh, communities for action. Tonight we have the uh, two items from the Land Use Committee, and at this time I'll introduce uh, Mr. Carlton Gordon, who serves as the chair of the Land Use Committee. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, very good. All right, the first one is a ULERP, so we'll be hearing, I guess, well, both of them actually, the ULERP, and the other one 
with a Board of Standards and Appeals. So it looks like we'll be doing roll calls on both of these matters. Uh, the first one is the ULIP for 86 Fleet Place. All right. And uh, 210001CRK. Uh, in the matter of the application submitted by Red Apple uh, 86 Fleet Place Development LLC, uh, pursuant to sections 183C and 201 of the New York City Charter uh, of, uh, amendment, he's for an amendment of, of these uh, zoning uh, resolutions, section 101. Dash one one and map two uh, in appendix E uh, to allow all non residential uses, uh, use group, uh, demilitated, demil whatever, uh, uh, underlying the zoning district uh, to include uh, community uh, facility use at 86 Fleet. Place uh, block two zero six one lots uh, one zero zero one and one zero zero four in Brooklyn Community Board two. Well, that means uh, I hope to summarize is that okay eighty six Fleet Place big one of our many big buildings here in downtown Brooklyn just down the block for me as a matter of fact. Place uh, right by uh, Myrtle Avenue uh, and just uh, Willoughby Street, and off also off uh, Flatbush Avenue. Um, the it's a big building, uh, and they had built a what would have been a commercial unit on the ground floor. It's a big, and these big was a thirty something story building, and they had anticipated that they would have, of course, a commercial use for it. Uh, Problem at that location is that uh, while Flatbush Avenue is busy, Myrtle Avenue is busy, a lot of people are on uh, Willoughby Street driving around. Fleet Place does not get gets a few people walking by and driving by, but not at any particular rate that would get a lot of foot traffic. And this is even prior to our problems with the uh, pandemic. Uh, they found that they just could not, the owners just could not make any uh, really uh, large uh, or good, let's say, you know, income from that particular space, uh, given what the uh, situation is at that particular location. So what they have requested board and, the, and on the ULERP is to make a change so that it will allow for uh, community facilities, uh, other facility, you know, other uses, other than this is the standard, usual commercial. Uh, and this was uh, supported by the Myrtle Avenue Business Improvement District. Uh, yes, by uh, Chad Purley uh, said, you know, they liked it and they felt that this would be of uh, uh, assistance for the community. And we, the community, our, our committee approved it 11-0-0, and we ask for your support to allow this change to go through. So moved. I get a second on the report. I'll second it. Daughtry, is there any discussion? My only discussion, this is John Dew is that I am co-chair of the Myrtle Avenue Business Improvement District, and I did speak in support of the change in this particular application. Ms. Peterson? Denise, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Good evening, everyone. I just wanted to ask a question about other uses. Was there anything specified as to what those other uses would be, um, Carlton? Uh, 
Uh, nothing, they didn't give any real heavy specifics, just that there could be community groups coming in, uh, could be uh, medical, uh, it could be a number of other, you know, because given that location, you would, one would expect, you know, regular commercial, uh, you know, you know, regular business, a bank, a uh, office, those kind of things. And that just didn't work out. So they wanted to expand it. Uh, they didn't have any specifics other than just would it allow us a community facility. So that means that, yes, you could have uh, community groups coming in, medicals coming in, others coming in uh, that may be able to use that space and to meet the, I guess, whatever rent they'll have to pay. Oh, okay. So I, it just seems to me that they, I'm, I'm assuming they had some idea. Maybe they didn't speak to it, but I'm assuming that they have some ideas about what that. Well, uh, they like. might, but it's, uh, you know, they, they, right now they're just want, they're open right now to, I guess something other than right now they don't have anybody right now. It's empty. It's a, it's, a, it's an empty space right now, mm -hmm. and they want to get it filled, and and get it filled at a reasonable return. They did make reference. To a daycare center, which is at the community needs. Right. Okay. So, with that daycare center, so since they're so close to public housing, which is Ingersoll houses, so if they use that as a daycare center space, would there be some consideration to those who would want to sign their children up that if there's a cost, that there would be some allowance for those who wouldn't be able to pay the amount of money that it would take in order for that. We didn't get that far. We didn't, okay. we didn't okay. get that. We didn't, we really, that's really going much further than uh, we had discussed. We basically, they're just looking to get some people in there. Okay. Um, keep in mind, there was already a, just up the block is the day, was a daycare center. Now that daycare center uh, was closed actually, and now it's a uh, it's a privately owned space, and it's really not even in use right now. They just they daycare people who were running the um, I forget the name of it right now. It's just down the block for me, but that daycare center just didn't get as much support as they had hoped from the community. But who knows? Right now, there's nothing. Uh, there's no. It's an empty space. They're hoping to open it up. Uh, and I guess it'll be open for applications for people to uh, try to come up with a with something that is, I guess, they can pay the the rent and at the same time provide a service to the community. Well, if the service, if they provide a service and it's too high, I'm thinking that uh, the, the community would not benefit from that. So I think when when they when an entity is asking for the support of the community board. And there's a neighboring community uh, that sit there as well as a community with high uh, community of people with higher income that live in those other high rise residential buildings attached that there be some consideration for those who are also neighbors, uh, which are those people who live in public housing. So, I, but I thank you for your, your response. Yeah. And thank you, Mr. Singletary. Ultimately, uh, ultimately it's going to have to come from people who somebody and ha somebody has to apply with money and say we wish to use that space and we're willing to pay the uh a, a particular rent for that space thank you any other discussion on the motion i would just quickly thank add you. um that the uh, applicant did say that they have been trying to get a commercial you know per the as of right a commercial tenant for, since the building's been opened and has not been successful but he did say, if I'm recalling correctly, that there has been more than one entity uh, that's community facility based that's interested in the space. So they did try to fill it with the as of right um, and do have interest from, I believe, a daycare and potentially a medical office for that space. That's exactly it. Again, it's um, the whole thing is that right now it's they were hoping to do a uh, you know, a space that would be a normal commercial rate that and to get a, a commercial entity 
that could pay what they would feel is a market rate. They couldn't get it. They couldn't get anybody into that space at the market rate. So now they're looking to open up the possibilities for a, you know, for, you know, community facilities. Again, it could be a number of things that could go in there, but it just gives them an opportunity. We, we don't even know who will ever get get in there right now. It's a it's a mystery, but you know we're we're speculating as to what could go in there, and by opening up to community facilities, it does uh, open up the uh, range of possibility as to uh, what, who can go in there, and hopefully will be of benefit to the community, especially into Ingersoll. Any other questions on the motion? Any other discussion? Okay, this is a roll call vote. So I'm going to ask Carol Ann or Taya um, to call the members of the community board. You will then cast your vote um, just to be clear in support of the committee's recommendation or against the committee's recommendation. And then our lovely secretary will be recording the vote. Carol Ann or Taya, are you prepared to do the roll call? Hi, Chair Singletary, I can do that. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Um, we currently have the list in order, alphabetical order by committee. <laughs> uh, Bill Flanoy? Yes. Denise Peterson? Yes. Catherine Gilman? Yes. Denise, you're on mute. Did you vote yes, no, maybe? No, I said yes. Sorry. All right. Yes. I think she nodded ahead, so let's go with yes. Who's no, I said ahead? yes. I said yes. I hear it too. Catherine's a yes. Ron Cohen? Yes. Lindsay Einhorn? Yes. Ola Geyser? Mr. Geyser? I saw him. Where is he? Oh, you're muted, Mr. Geyser. You could shake your head or, okay, that's a yes. Uh, Jessica Krejci? Yes. Planita Medley? I believe she was on as well. Okay, we'll circle back. Uh, Maisha Morales? Yes. Latrell oh, Mosso? I'm sorry. Tell you, let me let me just interrupt for a second because we in order for this to go smooth, for those of you who have the ability to come off mute and say yes, it's encouraged that you do so. To come off mute to say no, it's encouraged that you do so. If you come off mute to say um, abstain, it's encouraged that you do so. Just having the hand gesture is a little difficult because if you're reading the list, you may not be able to track it. So let's go back to Jessica. So because I believe she gave a hand gesture, and I, I don't want to lose her vote. Okay, let's go back to Jessica before we go back to Ms. Morales. Absolutely. And Chair Singletary, there may be a slight delay on your audio because I'm actually hearing uh, verbal confirmation. Uh, Jessica Okay, Krishy? so with me, I'm sorry. I just want to make no sure problem. we don't lose the vote. That's all. No problem. Uh, Jessica Krejci? Yes, I said yes. Clanita Medley, I believe, is not with us this evening. Uh, Maisha Morales was a yes. Litrell Masso? Yes. Celeste Staten? Uh, Kate, can can I just do a, a tip? And if you press on your computer your space bar, you're temporarily unmuted and people can hear you. That is a great tip for some users, I believe. <laughs> Depends on your. On your hardware. Uh, Celeste Staten, are you with us this evening? Let's see her. All right. Uh, Kate Yearwood Young. Yes. Len Jordan. Shirley McRae. Len Singletary. Excuse me. Thank you. Interrupt for a second. Uh, Taylor? 
the the public members are not voting so we need to um not include the not include them for the vote switching gears sorry no problem uh mr singletary is definitely a full board member accused brandon smith yes jessica thurston yes victor andrews Koso bob john harrison nicole mcknight yes tanya richardson carlton gordon Yes. Irene Jenner. Yes. Azra Ali. Yes. Ernest Augustus. Mr. Augustus? I believe he's on the call. I'll come back to him. Esther Blount. Yes. Audrey Costafen. Yes. Anthony Ipoli. Mr. Eric Spruill, Alan Washington, Ms. Barbara Zoller-Gringer. Yes. Andrew Lastowecki. Yes. Carolyn hubbard Kamenanweri. <clears throat> she is with us. Carolyn, are you unmuted? Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Suzanne Quint. Yes. Dwight Smith. Mr. Smith. Candace Harrison. Oh, apologies. Julia Conchum. Yes. Cheryl Gelbs. Ms. Gelbs. Okay, welcome back, John Quint. Yes. Thank you, John Du. Yes. Doreen Gallo. Yes. Brian Howold. Yes. Sydney Meyer. Yes. Sarah Scala. Mr. Scala. Okay. Betty Fibush. Yes. Dorothea Thompson Manning. Yes. Uh, Meredith Phillips Almeida. Nicholas yes. Ferrer. Oh, that you are here. I'm so sorry. That was a yes from Ms. Phillips Almeida. Nicholas Ferrera. Yes. Samantha Johnson. Yes. That was a yes. Yes. Uh, Oscar Luckett. Yes. And finally, Santia Pelagia. Yes. Ms. Thurston, do you have a count? Yeah, I have a count of 33 in favor and one um, recusal. One recusal. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to double check my number, but it, it passes. Great. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, now we move on to another one. We will have also have a roll call on this one, so just get ready. Um, <laughs> This is for 161 Emerson Place. It's a board of standards and appeals application. Uh, or actually, in the matter of the application of 2020-84 uh, BZ filed in the, at the Board of Standards and Appeals on behalf of the Institute for Community Living uh, pursuant to section 72-21 uh, and 73-623 uh, of the zoning resolution of the city of New York for a special permit uh, and, uh, and a variance 
of the zoning resolution of the, you know, at the, for, okay, for, yes. It's really, or at least a maximum a permitted floor area, maximum number of, uh, of floors, uh, dwell, yeah, maximum number of dwelling units, uh, maximum of uh, wall and total uh, height, maximum uh, number of stories and uh, required and required uh, a rear yard, uh, inner court, uh, and uh, okay, rear yard, inner court. <laughs> Uh, regulations uh, to facilitate the development of the new of a new use group two with four eleven stories and cellar re, uh, re, uh, residential uh, building uh, for, of eighty one units of affordable uh, housing uh, and also a. Uh, a, a Affordable, okay, affordable, supportive uh, housing at 161 Emerson Place, uh, Block 1909, Lot 1, Brooklyn Community Board 2. Uh, basically, this is a, what it is, it's an older building that's been there for, uh, for a number of years on Emerson Place. It is a, uh, it's helped out a number of people and it continues to help a number of people over the years. It's currently being run by the Institute for Community Living. Uh, however, it's be, they feel it's become not because of the age of it, a need to do expansions inside the building as well and to reconstitute some of the, a number of the units. So the idea is, and they want to try to serve uh, families in need, especially families that need to be uh, reunited, and this is one of the things that they wish to do. So they want they want to set it up as for a low income for affordables, and afford again it will be for people who have money but who need a place to live, and this is will be of help for folks who need these particular places. Uh, Institute Community Living uh, has done some good work in our community. Uh, they currently have that place over on uh, Nevin Street by Livingston, uh, and, which, and they've been doing some work over there, and it's uh, actually, well, it's Skimmerhorn rather, excuse me, not Livingston. And they've been uh, providing help for people in need. Uh, and support from the New York State Office of Mental Health. Uh, and they have shown us that they wish to do a lot of good work in this particular building. Uh, we have had support from one of the uh, tenants in there who, who was happy to see that this work, well, will be inconvenient, it's gonna be construction. They're happy to see that the work will provide better housing and better facility in the future. Uh, we liked it, and we uh, our committee approved it ten zero zero, and we ask for your support on this one. I'll entertain a motion to accept the committee's recommendation. So moved, Bill Flannoy. Yeah. Uh, second, you, Irene Janner. Second, Thank Irene Janner. Janner. Thank you, Ms. Janner. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, John do to discuss the motion. Uh, the Myrtle Avenue Business Improvement District has a division that works beyond the district itself. And we have been very active in supporting this particular project because we have 1,717, excuse me, 70,000 homeless families in the city of New York. And we simply did the math. If every community district takes its fair share, each community district would have to take up with 12 or 1,300 families. So this for us was relatively easy. We have to do our fair share of elements of folks that are part of our society. So we were very anxious to see this project move forward. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. Question? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, Carl. Oh, thank you. Um, you mentioned someone who's living in the building now. What percentage of the building is occupied, and will those tenants be there during the construction, and then will they be able to live there afterwards? Will anyone be displaced from that building is basically my question as a result of this. I think some will be moving out to some of the other facilities that uh, Institute Community Living have. Oh. I think will be remaining. Uh, they will have they will have to be move move out and then move back in because they are redoing they're redoing the entire building up, up okay. and putting in new uh, facilities, new uh, infrastructure as well. But people will be coming in and coming out. Uh, but there there's the general sense that yes, we're happy to see that this will be an improvement. It, the units will be expanding to me to allow for families. And that's the key thing is to allow for families who have been split apart or don't have a place to reunite and live. So that anyone who's living so before you ask your next question, Robert, let me let me just call on Georgia. I think she has a very passionate uh, statement that could cop of cop that can yes. um, complement what's being said. Um, yes, thank you. I just wanted to add some detail to what Carlton mentioned. This is an existing family reunification center that ICL runs. It's in an old building and the units are too small in addition to the need for more capacity. They are proposing a brand new construction, an 11 story building, which is taller than what's currently allowed by right, but it will be able to provide modern sized and modern appointed units that um, these these families need. Um, 100 percent of the units will be 60 percent or less of AMI. That is a regulatory agreement that runs with the land, as they say. So um, that's an important piece of information. And I believe ICL said that um, anyone who wants to come back to the building who's currently living there will have the right to do so. So I don't believe that they're expecting any displacement without um, it being the choice of the resident. That's all. Thank you so much for that. Um, so they are going to add stories to the building. Is that what's going to happen? They're not tearing it down. No, they're tearing it down. It's a brand new building. Um, oh. That lot is very uh, long and narrow. And so they need a number of um, uh, BSA approvals in order to fit the building that they're proposing on the lot. I see. And how many apartments are there now? And how many apartments will there, there be in this new building? I can't remember that. I think it's each one. I think it'll be a units will be as the proposed, but I'm not definitely certain. Did you say 81? Okay. I just took a look at the the notes from the meeting and it's currently 31 and, and Carlton is correct. It's moving to 81. Thank you very much. Any other discussion on the motion? All right, hearing none. I'm team, sorry. Are we ready for this our roll call? I just have one question. I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute myself in time. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Melissa. I'm Marissa. Oh, Aisha. It's Marissa. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, and I apologize in advance if you did mention this, um, and and I I may have missed it, but. Will there be on site direct supportive services for the residents in the building? Okay, yeah, actually, yeah, no, and I didn't mention, but they do their general uh, Institute of Community Living generally has people on site. So it's just uh, where you, you move in and you're uh, trying to, you know, you manage on your own. It's not like a, a private, let's say, uh, residential facility where. You know, you just move in and just, you know, try to get your services, uh, regular, I mean, building services. They realize that the people that who are coming in are people who do will need supportive services, who will need help so that they will have people on site. They do that already in some of their other places. And they, you know, they try to work with those folks to get them employment, to get them education. Uh, and to pull together and to become a real real families again. 
So they will the Institute for Community Living does that in their facilities. It's more than just a, a place to sleep. It's a place that they'll be living and it will help the people to uh, become, you know, comfortable and to be able to overcome, you know, problems that they've had in the past. Any problems that they face currently, they will have people on site to help the people, you know, the uh, people who will be residing in the new facility. Um, I, have, I have a question. Is this, sorry, this is my first time. Um, are, yeah. member, are new people allowed to ask questions at this time? At uh, this time, it's only board members. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chair. Yes. Yes, uh, Carlton. Yes. Thank Carlton. you, Mr. Chair. So, generally speaking, from what you just said, this would be termed um, loosely uh, an assisted living facility, correct? Uh, as you can call it, it's a it's affordable, it's a place, it's a place that they could live uh, from the Institute for Community Living. They'll be there to come out and to help people to, you know, overcome, you know, past problems and to become people who live stably and happily. Right. And the address again is? Uh, one six. What's it? What's it what? <laughs> Hold on. Six one Emerson Place. One six um, one. One six one. One six one Emerson Place. Um, it's it's not. Right. Yeah, it's not far from at land as we you might want to call it. It's in that general area. It's it bounded by um, Willoughby and, and Merle. Uh, I think it's a little bit south, but I. Yeah. In other words, all right, so let me, I'm sorry, Carlton, let me restate the question. In front of me, so I can't, you know, I can't. Is, is, is this the address that um, ICL had as a facility already? I think this is a new, relatively new one. They've had some facilities before. Uh, they have a number of facilities, but this is a new one, if I recall. I saw the list and I don't remember all of them. Again, the one that I'm familiar with, the one that's in, sort of like in Borm, on the border of Borm Hill in downtown over right. by Nevins and Skimmerhorn. That one I know, right. I used to walk by it regularly. And they, right. I've even gone in there once or twice and it's a uh, help, again, people who need help. Right, because ICL picked up an address on um, Emerson a couple of years ago. I believe it came before the Health, Environment, and Social Service Committee. Um, don't get me to lie about that. But they picked up an address that was formerly an address that my alma mater had as a married student storm. It was on the corner of Emerson and Willoughby, or just off. The corner. I think it's the same address. I do believe. It's it's one sixty one Emerson. All right. One, six, other, one, other discussion yes. on the motion before we call the roll? I just have one question for Carlton. Yeah. Carlton, um, can we uh, be so sure that this is really going to happen? Because um, we've seen so many speculative uh, zoning changes and things like that where, you know, in my own neighborhood in 1997, um, you know, we supported a variance um, for the Phoenix House. And you know now the Phoenix House, after their renovation, they ran out of money and sold it to Alloy developers. So with the zoning change, um, there's no assurance that, you know, the, you know, all the tenants will be leaving. So there is a possibility that the, or I'm asking you, do you have any sense there's any possibility that? Well, again, and as Daughtry pointed out, the BSA requirement, part of it is that a will file with the block and lock in the uh, registry office that this is going to be an affordable. So they just can't. If anybody were to do the title search, let's say it does want to be sold, let's by some chance, whoever gets it to see that 
it, they just can't, it cannot be a, you know, a, 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 pro, a market based private facility just like that. It, it will have a requirement that this is going to be affordable all the way, almost all the way through. So they just can't just knock it off. Uh, we've had good, again, good relations with the Institute for Community Living. Um, I'm not going to say that it's 100% going to be definite, but they have done what they said they're going to do in the past. They have a number of other facilities around the city. Again, take a look at what they've been doing over on uh, <clears throat> Nevins and Skimmerhorn. They've been there a number of years. They just don't disappear. So I don't believe that just, you know, that. And again, the uh, requirement that the affordables are run with the property and it's filed with the um, registrar's office, it just can't become a private thing. And, and anything they would have to do would have to go before again, uh, us, BSA, I guess it'd have to come back to us again because we gave approval, but BSA just says, this is what this property is going to be. So this can't. I have a question, um, Carl. Any, any regard, other questions? Yeah, can you guys hear me? I hear you. I agree. I have sorry, a question regarding Sam Johnson. Hey, Sam, go ahead. Hey, um, so I have a question in regards to transferring of residents. There's, as you all know, currently an ICL facility that is on Tillery and I wanted to know were there any conversations of assisting those individuals to transfer over to this facility um, and because the current facility right now is not. Well, more people, yeah, they, I mean, it's not saying that it's going, they have, part of the problem is going to have to, people will have to be moved around. There's no question. Uh, it's, they won't be able to just sit in their place, and especially with construction, uh, there's no way, you know, just to be able to sit in the same unit, you know, while the construction is going to go on. But there are, they are going to provide help and residents, at least temporarily, and people who are want to go back will go back to that uh, facility in Emerson. They have a number of other facilities as well. And this isn't, uh, again, I don't remember all the facilities, but they have several facilities. Uh, around the city, and this isn't the only one. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, can I um, interject? Yes. Um, to to speak a little closer to the point that Ms. Johnson was made was asking. These are two different populations. So the population from Prince Street will not be the population that goes to Emerson. At Emerson, it's a family supported shelter. So it's for parents who are reuniting with their children. Um, and that's not the population that's over at Prince Street. But, yeah, that's a different, yeah, that's a whole different uh, building over there. The one that's going up, I guess, heading towards the BQE, if I recall correctly, uh, going down in Tillery. And that's a uh, basically a uh, a regular shelter. Well, not a regular shelter, but it is a shelter, a single shelter. This again is going to be, and the purpose of this facility of Emerson is for, you know, as been said, family reunification. People who, yes, they've been split up because of bad circumstances. They be able to have their families together. These are fa these are going to be family units. That's why they're expanding. The uh, size of the units can be family units. It isn't going to be just a. a school. I, I, so listen, listen. This this is what I like to do. I'm I'm not trying to have a mini uh, land use meeting. So uh, <laughs> let's move this along. This is more uh, than I, we I, got I, I, at the I, meeting. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the spirited conversation and the questioning. That, that's that's approved. I, I like that. But um, let's move forward. And 
And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot of this as I go along the way. And so um, thanks to those of you who have my uh, cell number. Uh, Caroline, I'm going to ask this question. This is going to the BSA, correct? Board of Standards and Appeals, correct? Okay, thanks, Daughtry. So this doesn't require a roll call vote. So fine with me. It does. I actually think it does. I, um, we can't go around doing it. <laughs> Fair point. We'll, we'll clarify this offline. So. You're absolutely right. We can't go wrong doing it. Um, I'll get clarity on that, and I'll get brushed up on my my rulings after the meeting, so I'll be ready for the rest of 2021. But that being said, all right, no more questions. Um, I appreciate the, the spirited and informative discussion. So, uh, Taya, let's do a roll call. Let's mm -hmm. leave off the public members, and the floor is yours. We're ready this time in alphabetical order. Hazra Ali. Yes. Victor Andrews. Victor Andrews. Ernest Augustus. Esther Blount. Yes. Daughtry Karstefan. Yes. Crystal Cobb. John Cohen. Yes. Juliet Colin Chung. Yes. Don Du. Mr. Du. We know he's here, so we'll come back. Lindsay Einhorn. <clears throat> Lindsay Einhorn. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry. Betty Bush, no problem. Betty Bush. Ms. Betty, where did you go? She's definitely She here. was here. Yeah. We'll come back. Nicholas Ferreira? Yes. Bill Flanoy? Yes. Irene Gallo? Yes. Beryl Gelbs? Catherine Gilman? Yes. Carlton Gordon? Yes. John Harrison. Yes. Was he yes from John? Yes. Uh, Brian Howold. Yes. Carolyn Hubbard Kamenamiri. Anthony Ibelli. Irene Janner. Yes. Sam Johnson. Yes. There she is. Len Jordan. Jessica Krishi? Yes. Andrew Lastowecki? Yes. Oscar Luckett? Yes. Nicole McKnight? Yes. Anita Medley? Yes. Sydney Meyer, Sid Meyer? Yes. Aisha Morales? Yes. Paul Mosso? Yes. Tia Pelicia? Yes. Denise Peterson? Yes. Was that Santia or Denise that just said yes? I'm sorry. Uh, Denise, Denise, Denise said yes. And Santia said yes as well. Thank you. Meredith Phillips Almeida? Yes. Suzanne Quint? Yes. John Quint, no addition. Tanya Richardson. Sierra Scala. Mr. Lenny Singletary. Yes. Brandon Smith. Yes. Dwight Smith. Eric Spruill. Uh, Celeste Staten. Dorothea Thompson Manning. Yes. Jessica Thurston. Yes. Alan Washington. Kate Yearwood Young. Yes. And Barbara Zoller-Gringer. Yes. Great. 
Um, Ms. Thurston, I have 34 yes, 3 absent, no, 33003. Thank you very much, everybody. I think this is a good one. 34. Ms. Thurston, that was a 34. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Carlton. I, I appreciate you leading that discussion and, and just the word of encouragement. Um, <laughs> there are, especially since we're in a virtual environment, if those who, whose schedules will allow, I encourage everyone as much as you can, join the committee meetings. That's where you get really a robust discussion. That's where you get a lot of information. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that you have to participate in all of them, but the more that you can, the better informed we all become on some of the items that require a vote. So again, thank you for the questions and the discussions. That is no way to imply that the general body meetings are in a place to ask questions and get greater detail on items that require a vote, but you're always gonna get more information at the committee. Um, so before I jump to the next item on the agenda, which is committees to report, I do want to acknowledge that um, there are some of the elected officials who are here in person. And so what I like to do is when the electeds are here in person, I like to give them the floor. Um, and so unless I hope uh, he's still here, but I newly elect, because the last time he visited us, he was um, newly elected, but now he is official, he's sworn in. And so earlier I saw um, Senator uh, Jabari Bridgeport on the line. I'm not sure if he had to drop off, but um, Senator Bridgeport, if you're if you're on, uh, the floor is yours if you want to make some opening comments um, as the newly elected senator for the 25th. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I am here. Good evening, Community Board 2. Congratulations on a uh, successful vote and a robust discussion. I'm always glad to see a local democracy in action. Um, hello again, for those who don't know me, I am the new uh, state Senator in the 25th State Senate District, which includes Community Board 2 and um, the neighborhoods of Fort Green, Clinton Hill, Bed-Stuy, among many others, taking over Velmanette Montgomery retired at the end of last year. Uh, feel free to reach out to my office with any concerns. Oh, thank you for the person that put the uh, link into the chat. Um, I'm going to put my um, government email as well into the chat, as well as our phone number if you have any constituent concerns. And for those of you who are fans of Maisha Morales, uh, she is also um, part of our staff and she is killing it. So um, feel free to reach out to us for any concerns from housing to education to harassment to unemployment, um, anything you can think of. And we will do our best to help you in a timely fashion. And let's have a great 2021, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, congratulations once again. Um, so we, we've been doing this a lot tonight. So <laughs> congratulations on your on being selected as our new representative in the state Senate. I know you got a lot of work ahead of you. And so we look forward to hearing from you and your staff. Um, and so if you don't mind, um, you always have an open invitation when your schedule allows to come back to community board to and address um, whenever you can. And if you don't have the time, Feel free to send a representative. We'll always have a placeholder for that. Thank you, Chairperson. Okay. Um, so, unfortunately, for those of you who are not the representative themselves, you have to wait to the end of the meeting, which is your normal section. So, <laughs> unless I'm missing anyone else, I believe that there was a possibility that Senator Brian Kavanaugh may be joining tonight, but I don't think he's on. I think he has a representative who will be representing him shortly. So with that, uh, let's go into the next item on the agenda, which is item number 10, committees to report. We'll start with the Economic Development and Employment Committee, Mr. Bill Flanoy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the committee met uh, first Tuesday of the month and we discussed the agenda for the rest of the year. Our focus is basically on the district statement of needs, the items that were approved by the board. We want to, want to basically also uh, get on board with that and see what we can do as far as being proactive and uh, pushing forward our agenda as far as these items that we, uh, the actual board approved. Also, we're looking at the situation with the small businesses and the employment situation since the COVID uh, pandemic has occurred. Hopefully by June, uh, everything will be turned around, we'll start seeing stores open up, and we'll also start seeing employment start to pick up. So our goal basically is to see if we can find avenues to actually 
uh, address both the unemployment situation as far as helping people become employed and also helping the small businesses reopen and actually help them being financed going forward. Um, so we are looking at that going forward and we're going to reach out to different uh, agencies to see what they have that we could actually help uh, uh, disseminate within the uh, district. Uh, in addition to that, I made the uh, committee aware of the developments that are going on in Governor's Island. Okay, which is currently uh, not with necessarily within our district, but it's something that our district does use. And basically, just give them an update on that. And uh, other than that, uh, we have still we still have the uh, employment. Uh, I put this. Uh, the the uh, we're working with Brooklyn. Sorry, the Brooklyn Navy Yard with a uh, employment fair. Okay, that hopefully we'll have set up by June, uh, and that also help individuals find jobs in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next committee to report is the uh, Health, Environment, and Social Services Committee. Chairperson is Mr. Uh, Brandon Smith. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, we had a very robust Health, Environment, and Social Services Committee meeting last, last week on uh, Wednesday, uh, we were honored to be joined by the transportation committee for a joint committee meeting and a really good discussion on homelessness and more on the, the kinds of services that can be provided to the homeless in our in our local community. We had uh, representatives from Canva who operates a shelter over on Prince Street at our meeting in addition to a representative from the uh, the Brooklyn Borough Director of the Department of Social Services who was there. So we, we covered all kinds of topics about different kinds of services that could be provided to the homeless, what folks should do if they identify somebody in need of assistance, call 311. There, there, there is supposed to be someone sent there within an hour. Um, there we, we talked about the NYPD and, and the homeless. We, we had a really a good productive discussion and I think it will bode well for future conversations we have as committee about how we prepare for um, district needs and, and project ideas that we can move forward with. Um, I'd be remiss not to note that we had our standard liquor licenses, which we heard in uh, the, the last meeting. We had three of them and we actually voted to disapprove one out of the three. There, the other two had no community uh, concerns and, and the committee uh, voted to support them unanimously. but. There was a, uh, a physical cultural establishment, which we, we know as a gym that was located down on Park and Waverly Avenue, which um, had experienced a couple of fires and a flood. There was some debate about whether they were serving alcohol where versus the where they were saying they didn't serve alcohol, but there was some evidence on the web that they, they did serve alcohol. There was some, uh, some a number of concerns from the residents of the building and it, um, it didn't seem to be reconcilable or um, in the best interest of the community to approve the application. So uh, we voted uh, in to disapprove that. Um, we're also looking kind of going forward as a committee about different kinds of objective guidance we can apply to, to focus on um, what factors in liquor licenses really require a sort of a deeper dive or a deeper dig so that we uh, can be a better service to the community in that regard. So I think it was a very productive discussion. And between the meeting and and today, I had the opportunity to attend the uh, New York City Health Department's uh, presentation on vaccine awareness. And I ex expect that there's going to be um, a lot of further information that comes out in that regard going forward. They, they made a, us aware of a social media kit that uh, includes some information about uh, vaccines, which you, you may have heard, but and they also encourage folks to keep up to date with the D city Department of Health website where there's a lot of information about that. So um, there's a lot of things happening in the world of health. I encourage you to come to our meetings in the future. We're the first Wednesday of the month, and uh, you can also find our, our meetings like the one last Wednesday on the YouTube archive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate the report. Next committee to report is on parks and recreation. Uh, Barbara Zalagringa is the chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Singletary. Uh, just to follow up on what Brandon said, I was on the NYC um, vaccine site today. It's very user-friendly and informative. Um, 
So they, they've done a really good job on that. I'm delighted to report that there is a lot going on parks wise and which is really great because now more than ever we need the parks and more and more people are using them. Um, we met Monday night. We had three presentations. We were very fortunate. We heard from representatives from the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, which you may be familiar with. It's a 20 year old nonprofit and um, focuses on the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway. Um, it will eventually be 26 miles long. It is now 20 miles long. And as you might expect during this year, there the numbers of the usage of the Greenway, both by bicycles and pedestrians, has been significantly higher than it was in 2019. Uh, they were here specifically to tell us about the Naval Cemetery landscape, which is located at Kent and Flushing uh, with Willoughby. And um, the cemetery also has experienced a third more visitors in 2020 than it did the year before. They are. Um, they have a lot of new resources. They have a self-guided tour online. They ha they present seed packets, bookmarks. They're very much involved with native wildlife and uh, native plantings, and virtual programming. They've recently received an award for their work. Um, they're very into butterflies. And th they have a number of plans in mind, and they're looking for participants. Uh, get some funding from participatory budget budgeting this year to do some um, additional work. Then uh, we heard from a proposal uh, concerning the Northeast Fort Greene Park Playground bathroom. We then heard from the uh, Economic Development Corporation on the Willoughby Square Open Space Project. Those of you who are uh, longtime board members or a frequent um, member uh, visitors to our committee know that this project has come before us a number of times. At one point, there was going to be a garage underneath this space. Um, I'm delighted to tell you that plans are moving forward on the space as it is. It's a street level uh, park area which will have a fenced in playground. I asked uh, an important question, and it, which is when will I be able to walk in this finished park? But unfortunately, as you might expect, they don't have the answer to that um, question. What they did, um, we didn't really get an up close view of the park just quickly. The, from afar, it looked great. Uh, I think their main reason for, for um, coming to us Monday night was to t introduce us to the artist who has been picked to do the um, the art in the in the park. And she is Kamala. Janan Rashid, and very impressive um, artist who used to be a high school teacher. If you've been outside the uh, Brooklyn Museum lately, you've seen her work. She deals with words. She's um, the focus of what she's doing has to do with liberation, emancipation, and equity. <clears throat> there are five or six different locations in the park, including some benches, where she is going to be doing this work. It's all going to be words, and um, so. She is just starting the process. She's reaching out to the community. She's particularly interested in young people. And she's influenced to some extent by a book called The Power of the Porch. She's also looking at old newspapers to uh, be inspired by the font, particularly uh, newspapers that were um, geared to the African-American community in Brooklyn. And um, she's well no you're seeing some samples of her work. Uh, I think she seems like a terrific choice for this. We're very anxious to see what words or quotations she is going to be picking for the park and, um, you know, eager to, to be there. Uh, in addition, I wanted to mention that, um, as Carol Ann did last night, uh, there was a visioning, a, vision, a visioning session, the first one I've attended uh, virtually, which I thought it worked out terrifically for a uh, Kyler Gore Park. Uh, my fellow committee members know that this is a park that I have walked past many times and wondered why isn't it utilized more? Why isn't it? How do we get this park to be refreshed? And I am delighted to say that Councilwoman Lori Combo has found 5.6, about $5.6 million to address a lot of drainage issues in the park 
and um, to sort of redesign the park. Everyone is very much concerned about leaving the tree, the magnificent trees that are there. I think that's part of their plan. They're going to be reimagining the park, um, focusing on the playground. And last night, listening to the concerns, um, they had over 100 people last night. And they will be coming. They told us they will be coming to the Parks Committee, hopefully maybe June, to um, give us the design. This is the beginning of the process. So stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, our next meeting is a very exciting meeting on February 8th. Uh, we're, it's going to be focusing on community gardens. We've invited 15 local community gardens to come and present. We also will have an update from Playgrounds New York City, which is planning some um, events in our district in the spring, probably in April. And uh, Yeka and the Parks Committee will have another joint session on February 4th focusing on the Columbus statue. Any questions? Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, next committee to report is Transportation and Public Safety. Uh, the chairwoman is Juliet Colin Chong. Good evening, Community Board 2. At our uh, December committee meeting, uh, the Transportation and Public Safety Committee heard from a representative of Accessible Dispatch pa Taxi Service. This is not to be confused with Accessoride, uh, the accessible dispatch taxi service is regulated by the TLC. So, uh, the users do pay the metered fare. The uh, taxi service provides accessible wheelchair accessible taxis, um, dispatched within about 15 minutes of a phone call or an app request. Um, users can even call 311 to request 1 of these taxis. Um, the drivers are trained to assist um, persons with mobility impairments, and um, there are about 3,000 vehicles in the fleet that are accessible. Um, the rest of our uh, committee meeting was spent reviewing and planning, uh, reviewing uh, our 2020 meetings and then planning for 2021. Um, some of the ideas that our committee members discussed wanting to um, hear presentations on were, uh, for example, um, a presentation dedicated to the BQE, getting an update on that. Uh, we also wanted to hear about um, the effect of the pandemic on both the transportation and public safety sectors. We look forward to uh, potentially hearing um, an update about the Brooklyn House of Detention. Um, we have, uh, Put together questions for the Department of Transportation, and they are coming this month on January 21st to answer our questions um, and uh, also present to us about a uh, signage at the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, likewise, uh, we will be putting together questions for the MTA. So, if you do have questions that you would like our committee to address uh, uh, related to the MTA, you can probably email the district office. We have a Google Spreadsheets uh, document where we're keeping track of all of our questions um, in um, anticipation of the meeting. Um, likewise, uh, in um, conjunction with our statement of district needs, um, we are interested in um, hearing more about alternative sentencing and community courts programs. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, Next committee to report, Youth Education and Cultural Affairs. Betty Fiber serves as the chair. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone, and happy new year. First uh, meeting in the new year. So we did not have a December meeting of our committee, but I, I want to tell you about the next meeting. Youth Education and Cultural Affairs is having two weeks uh, Wednesday. We will have two superintendents, uh, the superintendent from District 13, as well as the high school superintendent, I believe, has accepted the invitation. So uh, this would be a really important meeting to get updates what's happening uh, with the community schools and the high schools uh, in our district and hopefully to ask some questions and get some answers beyond the usual. We hope so. And we're also going to hear from the District 15 um, Participatory Action Research. They've been looking at what parents really want from their local school. Will they be willing to go to 
schools that are further away for certain programs. And they've been doing a lot of grassroots uh, conversations uh, with parents and caregivers. So that should be pretty exciting. So thank you. I have to know local law seven will end up in the middle of mandate law. Mr. Singletary, your microphone is not picking up. Thank you. So before we jump in, so that concludes uh, item number 10, committees to report. Before we jump into open session, I want to uh, call on uh, Taya to have us recognize the um, representatives from the different offices of elected officials and any of our stakeholders, such as the Brooklyn Library. So Taya. Thank you, Mr. Singletary. Um, Ed Cerna from the Office of the Mayor. Good evening, Board 2, and Happy New Year. Uh, Edward Cerna, Brooklyn Borough Director for the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs. Uh, I wanted to talk about vaccines. So yesterday, New York City um, administered 28,599 doses. Um, we are on track uh, for hitting our goal of 175,000 vaccinations for the week. Um, the mayor this week announced that City Field, uh, the Mets um, stadium, is going to become the Queen's mega vaccination site, which means that it's going to be open 24-7, and it's going to be able to administer anywhere between 5,000 and 7,000 vaccinations a day. Uh, today was announced that talks are underway to get Yankee Stadium to also participate in this. Um, but for Brooklyn, uh, our mega site is at Brooklyn Army Terminal. Uh, the eligibility group has been expanded at the beginning of the week. It was for folks that were age 75 and older. That's been lowered to 65 and older. Um, so uh, definitely check the state's website to see if you fall under the eligibility criterions. Um, for your nearest test uh, vaccine site, excuse me, you can go to vaccinefinder.nyc.gov or you can call the hotline at 877-VAX4-NYC. Um, the phone system currently is from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week, but by the end of the week, uh, that should be at 24 uh, hours a day. Um, I guess, uh, lastly, I would just say that um, it was also announced today that the city is going to be pulling its contracts with the uh, Trump organization, given uh, the violence last um, week. Uh, the FBI has warned that there's, you know, potential for continued vi violence at state capitals. The latest is that there's no direct threats to New York City, but should that change, we would be, you know, we would make sure that the, the public knows. Other than that, folks, you know, to reach me, eCerna at, at cityhall.nyc.gov. I'm looking forward to working with everyone in, in this new year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Edward. Sarno. We appreciate the update. And uh, as always, you have, you uh, feel free to come back. Mr. Singletary, the next person is Greer Mayhew on behalf of Senator Brian Kavanaugh. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Greer Mayhew, Senator Brian Kavanaugh's office. Um, I have uh, several updates for you guys. Um, the first one is while everyone was um, in between Christmas and New Year's, um, the state legislator went back for emergency session to help um, to actually pass a law, the eviction moratorium extension. Um, they do uh, the law, which was also signed um, in effect on December 28th, um, does several things. One, it prevents evictions, which places a state for 60 days. Um, it creates a standard standardized hardship declaration form, which people who can um, declare that they have a hardship due to COVID can fill out and submit to their landlords to help prevent future um, evictions. Uh, it also protects against foreclosure and tax lien sales for residential property owners um, and prohibits negative credit reporting and discrimination in extending credit. Um, and lastly, it automatically renews uh, scree and DRE benefits. So that bill will waive the annual re requirement that eligible recipients will recertify for this year. Um, additionally, we wanted to remind everyone that the Emergency Rent Relief Act deadline, so the COVID-19 Rent Relief Program is live and the deadline to apply is February 1st. Um, interested applicants can apply via the DSCR website. I can also put that in the chat for people. 
um, people who've already applied before, they do not have to reapply to be considered for the governor. Um, that's just something. And uh, one other update is that um, I know the Senator has really been pushing for uh, the Brooklyn part of our district to um, participate in conversations about Governor's Island. Um, we know that the board has been very great in trying to circulate that information, although it's under the jurisdiction of, community, um, of Manhattan Community Board One, um, the, the, uh, the Senator is very much advocate, is advocating for Brooklyn's input. So there is a meeting uh, the Manhattan Borough President is having on January 20th. It's a panel discussion on the rezoning proposal. So please feel free to come and attend. Um, and that is all. If you have any other questions about any of the items that I mentioned, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my information in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the update. Looking forward to hearing more from you throughout the year. Next up is Ms. Linnell A. Barventura from the New York State Senate Majority External Relations. She may have dropped off. Okay, we'll come back. Olavia Bello for Assembly Member Joanne Simon. Ms. Bello, are you with us? Um, Olavia Bello is actually new to the office of Assembly Member Joanne Simon, and she had some announcements, so I'm sure she'll be back. Uh, Mr. John Watkins for Brooklyn DA's office, Eric Gonzalez. Oh, hi, I'm sorry, I'm here, it's Olavia. Hi, Olavia. How are you? I'm just on mute. So thank you so much, everybody, for having me today. So I just wanted to say I'm Alavia, and this is actually my second meeting um, for CB2. I just wanted to let you guys know that our office is open on Smith Street, and we have plenty of hand sanitizers and masks. So if anybody needs anything or just wants to stop by and share you know, how it's going for them during COVID, please do stop by. I'm going to post my contact information in the chat, so feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Olavia. Uh, Mr. Singletary's mic, I think, is offline again. Thank you, Olavia. I appreciate the update. Uh, I, I think you're new, right? Yeah, I've only been with Assembly Member Simon since uh, November, so this is only my second so CB2 meeting. So welcome, we, we look forward to seeing more of you throughout the year. Congratulations on being part of the team. Thank you so much, it's great to be here. Uh, Mr. Singletary, next up is John Watkins from Brooklyn DA Eric Gonzalez's office. Now you're yeah. regular, you know how this goes. <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> yes, yes. Hello everyone, and uh, I'm here from myself as well from DA Eric Gonzalez. Yes. Mr. Watkins, now, I'm sorry you about your. Muffled. Yeah, your microphone is pretty glitchy. Okay. Well, I think that's better already. Let's try this again. Is that better? Uh, there you go. Thank Much you. better. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, first of all, greetings uh, to everyone uh, from uh, DA Eric Gonzalez. Uh, sends us well wishes. Uh, the past uh, couple of months since uh, the holidays, uh, the DA and uh, the office have been quite busy. Uh, on most uh, days and including weekends, DA Gonzalez has been out in the community uh, very uh, assertively uh, engaging the community in all manner of different types of events and activities, uh, including food drive, uh, food distributions, I should say, uh, clothing drives and so forth. Uh, most uh, currently, uh, the DA has, uh, with his uh, uh, ADAs, have been uh, prosecuted cases that have come before uh, his office. And you should know that uh, the, uh, I'm just making an adjustment on my phone here. Uh, can you still hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, you should know that the, uh, that uh, in spite of what people may have heard, uh, the courts are, op are open and the DA continues with his uh, team of ADAs to, to prosecute cases that come uh, to, uh, uh, to the office. Uh, most uh, currently, uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, the things that are coming up is something the community should be know, knowing about, uh, and that is a human trafficking event. 
uh, that uh, more information can be found on that on the DA's website, which is brooklynda.org. Uh, the dates, there's two dates, the January 25th, uh, which basically is for uh, leaders of, uh, of houses of worship uh, and their organizations to uh, be involved in a training how to uh, engage the community on the, the issue of human trafficking. And then on the 27th is a more open, uh, of course, these are Zoom events, a more open Zoom event that uh, the DA will be hosting uh, with uh, various panelists and, and answering uh, questions and giving information. So the, the 25th and the 27th, respectively, in the evening starting about 5 o'clock. Uh, that's all I have to say right now. Uh, best wishes to everyone, hopefully uh, for a better and more prosperous and healthy uh, 2021. Thank you. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. I think we have Justin Freeman from Assembly Member Ferris Front Freeman's Forest Office. Justin? Hey, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, she said, my name is Justin Freeman. This is my first meeting with this community board. I am the district manager for the Office of Assembly Member Ferris Front Forest of District 25, which includes Bed-Stuy, Fort Greene, um, and the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So I'm happy to represent her this evening. Farrah couldn't be here, but you know she's here in spirit. She just wanted to let you know that she's here and ready to serve her constituents, especially um, around issues that are acutely affecting us collectively, like housing, evictions, healthcare, um, assistance with screenings and uh, DREES applications and, and other constituent services that our office is um, willing and ready to uh, provide. Um, we're really excited to serve the members of CB2. Um, I was actually, I moved to CB8, but CB2 is right across, um, you know, Fulton. So it's very near and dear to my heart. I hope, looking forward to seeing you um, and connecting with you. Um, in our office, and I'll drop uh, our office number as well as email so you can get a hold of us and establish uh, communications with us. Thank you so much. So, Justin, congratulations to you um, on your role and being part of the office of the newly elected uh, Assemblywoman for uh, our district for the 57th. We won't hold it against you that you're in CB8, but you got a lot of love in CB2. So, you know, welcome to come back anytime. And please, uh, when the assemblywoman has time, please extend the invitation. We'd love to hear from her in person. Um, and congratulations and best of luck throughout the rest of the term. Okay, Mr. Singletary, we've got Lamani Bravo Lopez for Council Member Levin. We may have Lamani, well, you're regular. You know how this works. Welcome. Where'd he go? <laughs> Okay, we'll circle back. Jason Herr for Council Member Combo. Another regular. Uh, it's good seeing a lot of familiar faces. Uh, happy 2021, as much as it can be. Um, I want to start with three items. Fiscal year 22 applications are now open. Um, you can go to council.myc.gov slash budget to apply for fiscal year 22 applications. Um, we are uh, Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer from Queens and Majority Leader Combo have been working together to set up a open culture program for the upcoming summer. So, the open culture program is a way for uh, it's much closer to the open streets program for our restaurants. We're looking to find public locations and space that our arts and cultural institutions can use throughout the summer. Uh, to provide programming, the programming and offerings. Um, our office and all council member offices are taking um, suggestions on possible street closures. Uh, you can reach out to me if you're having difficulty contacting your council member's office. Um, but it's either for CB2, it's either me or um, Elizabeth, I believe, over with us, council member Adam, uh, uh, Levin's office. The last thing I want to know is green playground. Uh, Council member majority leader combo and department of parks and recreations will be meeting tomorrow. Virtually, uh, 630 PM. Um, 
in order to discuss the future and just to get input as to how constituents feel about green playground and what the future of green playground. And that's that is all. Thank you, Jason. Good to see you. Uh, Mr. Singletary, we don't see Mr. Bravo Lopez, but we do see Elizabeth Adams. Did you wish to speak? Hi, uh, yes. How is everyone doing tonight? Happy Good. New Year. Good. Uh, Happy so New Year. Uh, a couple bill updates today to share with everyone. Um, so first is intro 2159. It is a parking violations bill, um, a civilian enforcement uh, program that allows for individuals to uh, to report violations of dangerous parking uh, violations that are that are happening in our city. We just had a hearing yesterday in the council on the bill. Uh, what the bill does just is a, a couple things um, similar to, to the idling program that we have for truck idling. Uh, an individual can upload a photo or video in an app uh, and report if there is dangerous parking that violations that are happening. So parking in uh, a bus stop or a bike lane for an extended period of time. Uh, and this was really ex in response to years and years of uh, placard abuse uh, and parking abuse that, that we have seen, particularly in, in the CB2 area, you know, um, around downtown Brooklyn. It's been a longstanding issue um, of parking in, in bike and bus lanes. So uh, that, that was really what led to this legislation of saying, you know, we would love to see agencies do, do full enforcement. Uh, it's not happening. It's not happening to the degree that we need. Uh, and so really giving people the power to, to do enforcement, to upload videos, and, uh, and uh, people would get 25% of the fine that is issued. Um, so really gives an incentive for uh, for people to participate, uh, and I think also gives a little nudge to to DOT and NYPD to um, to follow up on enforcement too. Um, so we're really excited about that one. Uh, it, we got a, a lot of positive feedback during the the hearing yesterday. If people have questions or comments or thoughts about the the, the bill, please feel free to to give us a call. Um, one question that we did get around the bill was um, whether this would lead to neighbors calling on their neighbors. Um, if that could be a potential concern, um, and and we really think that is that is out, not going to happen with this bill. First, what we have seen with the the, the idling um, legislation is it creates a program where people go through the process to oath. Um, it takes a little bit of time. I think it really really relies on people to be um, to, to take that extra step. Um, and so it it's, it won't be just for kind of when see some when someone sees you know, uh, a, a vehicle just stopped for a minute. It, it really is to focus on on some of these more harmful long term, you know, several hours in a, in a bike lane um, issue. So, so it's really getting at, at some of those more intent entrenched parking issues. So really excited about the bill. Uh, please feel to to reach out. And then the other bill that we have recently introduced a couple months ago, which we, we had a hearing on last month on as well. Um, and so we're looking forward to moving that that we're looking to forward to, to moving that uh, is the fair chance for housing bill. Um, and so what this does is really a, a ban the box bill for people when it comes to housing. Uh, so landlords would no longer be able to ask for background checks as, as a mandated requirement. Um, so for people who have been arrested or, or convicted of a criminal crime, that has often been a huge barrier in terms, in terms of accessing ha housing to such a degree that people who have completed their times in jail or prison have actually been held beyond their legal, beyond their sentence because they didn't have access to housing um, and there are really severe restrictions there. So uh, this bill came out really written in partnership with the Fair Chance for Housing Coalition. Um, they drove this in terms of introduction um, and are really driving the, the advocacy and organizing around the, the issue. Um, the coalition is comprised of formerly incarcerated New Yorkers, faith-based leaders, criminal justice reform advocates, public defenders, um, people who are, are really steeped in this world and said hey, this would make a huge difference uh, in terms of providing housing access for people who um, have been through the, the carceral system. Um, so yeah, so feel free to reach out to that one as well. Uh, and then the last thing I just wanna plug is today the, the PPP program opened up again for the second round. Um, so just open today. If you are a small business, if you know a small business, just wanna make sure everyone is aware of the PPP program um, and to, to get in the application for that. Please also feel free to reach out with, to our office with that. We know that a lot of people were 
cut out or, 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 um, or uh, there are a lot of restrictions on the program. Uh, if you have questions, um, if, uh, if you would like to, to help someone kind of guide you through the process, we're, we're here and, and congressional reps are, are great as well. Um, I did see Zach Martin's question of does this apply to NYCHA? This is a great question um, because it's, it's really been a priority of ours as well um, to do what we can on the legislative side to make sure that housing protections are just as strong for people who um, are, are living in public housing as well as private. Uh, we're still sorting through the, the, the legal authority. Um, we have a kind of blanket coverage of, of pending uh, pending state restrictions that will specifically cut us out. We say that it's covered. Um, we are still kind of looking, looking into the specifics of um, prohibitions because NYCHA gets federal funding um, that does provide some challenges in terms of kind of their, their restrictions um, versus, versus city and state. Um, we do think we have good standing uh, in other cities. They have uh, included public housing in terms of the, the when they have done a similar version of this bill. Um, so it's really on top of our radar. Um, and uh, and we look forward to talking with our state colleagues about that issue as well. Uh, I think that is a great place to continue that conversation too. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the update. Mr. Singletary, uh, Jason from Parks is not able to join on video, but he'd like me to share this link that I'm dropping in chat. This is about the uh, chair, Zoller Gringer mentioned the community input, input meeting for Kyla Gore Park that occurred last night. This is for the community input meeting for Green Playground on Green and Waverly, which is happening tomorrow night. And this is the link for the registration for that. All right, thank you. Who's next? Uh, Zaneb Ahmad from the NYC Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see faces. Um, thank you. I'll be brief. I know it's a, it's been kind of a long meeting. Um, so our agency, we are still uh, providing services. We are going up for our free tax prep. We're still kind of working over some of the um, the safety guidelines, uh, just because usually we would have um, in site tax preparers available for folks to come in and file their taxes for free. This time, unfortunately, it's still online and via phone, but we are working closely with our community partners, uh, specifically CAMBA and some of the other organizations to see if we might have some sites available for either uh, folks to, to drop off their, their taxes and then or either have them be uh, prepared on site. But again, because of this pandemic, it's um, most likely we'll still have them available online or via phone. Also, we are still providing uh, resources for businesses. So if there are businesses uh, have concerns around some of the um, additional uh, uh, information that's coming down the pipeline, if it's regarding licensing, um, the cashless span, uh, folks can still get in touch with us and we can provide them with um, not only uh, direct contact to the small business service uh, business compliance associates, but also with our um, enforcement team so they can get more information on that. I'm going to leave the links in the chat and also my contact. And if folks uh, have constituents who have questions or if you'd want to discuss uh, something else, thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Singletary, that is all of our electeds and agencies tonight. We do have a service organization and three, two service organizations. Sorry, yeah, I believe you have forgotten me. I hear Nan, but I don't see her. There she is, Ms. Blackshear. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't see you. You are forgiven. Okay, so let me begin. Good evening, Community Board 2. Uh, applications to become a new member of or to be reappointed to Community Board 2 are now open. Uh, you can complete your applications online via our website, and the deadline is February 12th. I believe Taya had put it in the chat earlier. I will add it later, uh, later on after my announcement. Uh, the Borough President's public hearing on 86 Fleet Street, which you all just uh, actually voted on, 
will take place Monday, January 26th at 6 p.m. via WebEx. The borough president proudly supports the relaunch of DOE's early childhood initiative, Brooklyn Basic. Go to brooklynbasics.org to learn five important evidence-based parenting and caregiving principles for kids from birth to age three. Parent University is a free course registration and management system where families can train on a wide range of topics that encompasses early childhood through adulthood. And you can go to um, parentu.schools.nyc for more info. Learn about 3K, pre-K, and kindergarten admissions. Families are welcome to attend to learn how to apply and what to expect to register. Call 718-935-2009 or email esenrollment at schools.nyc.gov. On December 2nd, the borough president partnered with City Tech to host a technology roundtable to discuss the role of tech industry during the pandemic recovery. The panel focused on how technology can help various fields move forward post COVID-19. On December 10th, the BP, excuse me, hosted a town call for hospitality businesses with the Office of Nightlife at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment for 200 plus people. You will learn how to access financial support and navigate issues like inspections and summons hearings. Uh, you can go to our YouTube channel, which I will put in the chat. The BP also co-sponsored legislation with Council Member Rodriguez that would allow permanent residents to vote in municipal elections. The legislation would allow approximately 1 million residents who live and pay taxes here to vote. And then last, um, the links to some of these announcements are in, will be in the chat along with my contact information for callers. Uh, you can reach me um, who, for, the, for the callers who are on the chat and cannot see, or who are on a call and cannot see the chat, you can reach me at 917-743-5529, or you can go to our website at brooklyn-usa.org. And while you're there, please visit our COVID-19 page for the latest info from reliable sources and learn about any upticks occurring in Brooklyn. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Ned. As always, it's good to see you. We appreciate you having the updates. And I guess to officially state, we saved the best for last. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lenny. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so, Taya, thank you for calling on. Mr. Singletary, I actually, if, I, I missed one. If I, I missed could just one make more. an adjustment real quick, let, let's call the cultural districts. I know we have representatives from the Brooklyn Library. They always participate. And I think we may have a representative from BAM. So in that order, let's see who, who's representing the Brooklyn Library this evening. Mr. Singletary, um, with apologies for this being the first time I'm doing this, I actually missed Tika right. Haraguchi from Comptroller Stringer's office. All right, that's fine. Hey everyone, uh, glad to be here tonight with Community Board 2. I'm Tika Haraguchi with Comptroller Scott Stringer's office. Uh, Happy New Year, you know, it's been a bumpy start, but here's hoping for a better year ahead. Um, so just a few quick updates. Um, so firstly, our annual paid summer internship program is application is now live. Um, it's for matriculated college students to apply. Uh, the deadline is March 5th. Um, all candidates must apply via our website to be considered. The program is nine weeks from June 7th to August 5th. The interns work 20 hours a week, Monday to Thursday. Um, and I will I will share that link. Um, secondly, today, Comptroller Stringer released a plan to make sure that New York City's small businesses get their fair share of the Paycheck Protection Program funding as the PPP program reopened today on January 11th. Um, this program was intended to support small businesses by helping them to retain staff and stem job losses. However, an analysis released by our office found that New York City lagged far behind in its share of eligible businesses that received a PPP loan. So just 12% of the more than 1.1 million employee-based and non-employer businesses in the city received a loan compared to more sparsely populated and less economically impacted states such as North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa, where more than 
of businesses receive such a loan. So the report also showed notable disparities between boroughs and industries receiving these loans with nonprofits getting minimal support through the program. So I will be putting our letter of recommendations in the chat as well. Um, and finally, the comptroller also today sent a letter to the mayor urging the city to stop shortchanging nonprofits who are on the front lines of the COVID relief um, and honor indirect cost rates um, promised to nonprofits for human services contracts in fiscal year 2021. Uh, this indirect cost rate initiative, which helps pay overhead costs and other indirect expenses incurred by nonprofits, was slashed in its first year of imp implementation after nonprofits had already spent the funding that was promised. Um, the city directed vendors to implement the cost changes while promising to pay for it down the road, uh, but this bait and switch left nonprofits out of pocket and in the red. Um, so I will also be putting that letter in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the update. And, and please um, let the controller know that I know he has a busy schedule. Every now and then he would pay us a visit in person. So I'll remind him that CB2 is waiting for another visit. All right. I will. I will. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Singletary, we have. So can we go on to my, my friends at the library or is, is somebody else we want to call before them? We have several service organizations and several cultural organizations, three each. Yeah, I'm holding the service organizations first. I want to go through the, the normal um, participants first. So how about I'm just going to make the call. Tracy, the floor is yours. All right, good evening, everyone. There's two other people here from the library, so I'll be fast. You can help design Brooklyn Public Library's next library card. We'll be releasing a limited edition library card celebrating Black American culture and history, and it's a partnership with the Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams and Brooklyn's community boards. It's gonna be released as part of our Juneteenth 2021 celebrations. And from January 4th to 31st, artists age 13 and up are invited to submit designs. The selected design will earn a $2,000 stipend. I'm gonna put a link in the chat with more information. We also have grab and go services at over 30 locations. Some of them you can pick up holds as well as return items. Others are return only locations. I'm gonna put a link in for the locations. Please check to see what services your location's offering and also double check their hours and whether they're open before they go. I'm also gonna put a link in for the Clinton Hill Facebook page where you can see our virtual programs and videos and register to attend the programs. And now, Kat. Hi, everyone. Um, great to see everybody here. Good evening, um, Community Board 2. Um, my name is Kat Savage. I'm the Managing Librarian at the Annex um, and soon to be Adam Street Library in Dumbo. Uh, very quickly, uh, just a reminder that the Annex is open at 1 John Street. Um, we have limited hours, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, 10 to 3. Uh, we are offering library card service as well as the holds, pickups, and returns that Tracy mentioned, as well as grab and go crafts for um, um, soon all ages. And um, I also want to mention uh, there's a boosted Wi Fi signal um, as part of uh, Brooklyn Reach. I'll put the link to that in, uh, project in the chat. That's available at the Walt Whitman branch and soon uh, over at Clinton Hill as well. And then I wanted to turn it over to uh, my colleague Rachel. Hi, can everyone hear me? All right. Um, my name is Rachel Tiemann, and I'm representing the Brooklyn Heights branch of the Brooklyn Public Library. As many of you know, we have been serving the Brooklyn Heights community from an interim space at 109 Remsen Street uh, for quite some time. And uh, I'm so sorry, I have a toddler here. Uh, so um, we have been serving the community at 109 Renson Street. However, after the pandemic, it was not safe for us to be able to um, operate out of that site. So the wonderful news is that there has been a partnership with Brooklyn Public Library and the Brooklyn Historical Society to create the Center for Brooklyn History, which is at 128 Pierpont Street, which is the site where Brooklyn History Historical Society was. We are now able to provide lobby service for the Brooklyn Heights community. 
in the site at 128 Pierpont Street at the Center for Brooklyn History. I'll be putting some links into the chat. Um, it, um, right now, the Center for Brooklyn History is not open at this time. They will be opening um, later this year. And staff from the Brooklyn Collection at Central Library, our main uh, hub library, will be moving over to the Center for Brooklyn History. We are providing um, holds pickup as well as book return service at the 128 Pierpont Street in the Center for Brooklyn History uh, from 10 to 4, Monday through Friday. Uh, and you can currently place holds to be picked up. Come by, say hello, return your books there, and we're going to be there until the new Brooklyn Heights Library opens, which is slated to happen late summer of this year. Thank you, Rachel. We appreciate the update from you and all of your colleagues from the library. And should your toddler want to be a member of the community board too, just see Nan Blackshear, we have applications ready, okay? Well, you know, you. she she may not uh, let you get a word in, so I'll I'll, I'll wait a bit on that. But uh, <laughs> she speaks her well, mind. Thank you. Not, I have practice now. I'm not worrying about it. I'm fine. <laughs> um, before we go to some of the other cultural districts, uh, I do want to recognize the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I think they have a representative as well who's on the line. Hi, right, Chairperson Singletary. Yes, it's Ethan. Hey, um, how are you? Good. I know you said earlier that there's vigorous uh, debate and discussion at the full board meetings, and that is why I come. Um, but I do see it's we're running a little long tonight, so I didn't have a true update. I thank you for recognizing me, and I just wanted to say to uh, Ms. Quint that I'm putting my contact information in the chat. I uh, did listen in earnest to her feedback about Navy Street at the executive committee, and but I didn't get her contact information, so I just wanted to give her my so, Ethan, thank you for, for being brief. You know, I, I love brevity, but before you do that, uh, I do recall you mentioning you got a promotion. So why don't you share with everyone your promotion and what your new role is at the Navy Yard? Yes, um, I was joining you in CB2. I was still the visitor services manager, but I was doing double duty um, for government affairs as we were a little short. And in the new year, I am now the government and community affairs manager for the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Congratulations, thank you, we appreciate that. Um, and, and we appreciate you coming. And so let me let me do my customary thing tonight. So uh, congratulations and, and look forward to future um, updates from you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the board and uh, district staff. All right, so I'm gonna give Taya a break. We're gonna pass the mic over to me for the last part of this party. And so now we're gonna call on any representatives from the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Do we have anyone from BAM? Hi, yes, uh, my name is Ellen Lazinski. I'm here tonight on behalf of BAM. I'm our Director of Institutional Advocacy. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I wanted to quickly plug our annual Martin Luther King Day celebration. Uh, this year, due to COVID, it's gonna be virtual uh, for the first time in our 35 year history of doing the program. But um, I've seen it in advance and I think it's a really um, dynamic version of something that we really love to do in person every year. Um, so I'll go ahead and put in the chat uh, a link. Oh, someone already did. Thank you um, to this year's celebration. Uh, and I you know, hope that you all check it out. It's also going to be streaming on Brick uh, TV. We present this program every year in partnership with the Brooklyn Borough President, uh, which we're very appreciative for. Here's a keynote speaker. And it's singers. So it's it's a big, but also a brief uh, program this year. It's it's a little over an hour. So um, I, I invite you all to um, see what it's going to be like virtually. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to having you represent them um, in a future meeting. So thank you. And I encourage everyone to take part in, I guess, what is somewhat of a hist historical event in the sense that this will be a virtual MLK celebration. So thank you. Calling next on the Red Cross. Do we have a representative for the Red Cross this evening? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Morrow, and I'm the Greater New York Red Cross Community Relations Ambassador for Community Board 2. 
I just wanted to bring you up to date what's happening around the country. Right now, the Red Cross is helping in 28 disaster relief operations. These operations are concentrated on the West Coast, battling fires and battling floods and storms over the whole eastern region of the U.S. In the last seven days, in our area, the greater New York area, we provided assistance to 117 adults, 47 children, and participated in 38 disaster responses. During these uncertain times, the Red Cross wants to assure you that we are prepared. Our website, redcross.com, through our free virtual training courses, can help you better, better prepare yourself for any uh, situation that may come up. We at the Red Cross want to wish you and your families a safe and healthy 2021. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak to you all again. Have a wonderful evening. Until next time. Thank you, Richard. Do we have a representative this evening from Impact? Okay, great. Do we have a representative this evening from um, the creative outlet? I'm sorry, this is Bernal Greer from Impact Brooklyn. <laughs> I, I just I heard would know. sort of my name being called, or at least the organization called. Um, just wanted to let everyone know that we continue to operate and to be able to serve um, the community at large in terms of with um, webinars and other information in terms of eviction, as well as helping with small businesses. Um, we are going to have a, what we call an insider um, meeting um, webinar on January 27th. It's going to be around 1130 in the, in the morning, and we will extend that invitation so that all of you can learn about what we're doing at Impact Brooklyn over these past few months and what we continue to do in, in the future. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the update. Do we have a representative from the, I believe it's called the creative outlet? Or if I'm looking at my notes, perhaps it's Jamal Gaines, Jamel Gaines, creative outlet renaming. Chair Singletary, we may have lost that representative. That's fine. I'm not upset. Okay, so <laughs> that concludes um, our session for a notable attendees. Item 11 on the agenda is open session. And so um, I say this every meeting, but I, I would really implore on everyone who's speaking the evening to um, be mindful of the time. And if you have any comments, please keep them to the pertinent high points, and we would greatly appreciate it. So. Um, if you have anything you'd like to say in open session, either um, submit your name in the chat and Taylor or myself will call you, or you can perhaps raise your hand. Go ahead, Lindsay. I promise not to use the full two minutes, Chairperson. Um, so last month, there was a new piece of legislation that was by Speaker Corey Johnson that I think is going to be incredibly important to follow for the community board. Um, he is proposing a new comprehensive planning cycle and planning framework for the city. Um, this is going to include the community district budget needs statement. Um, it's also accompanied by a report entitled Planning Together. This report highlights how the current planning fail framework has failed a lot of communities and contributed to some wide scale inequities in the economy, the housing market, and even health outcomes. Um, it's creating short and long-term goals, um, and it's a 10-year cycle that, again, is going to incorporate the work that we do every year. Um, and I'm wondering if it might make sense for the community board to think about um, taking a position on the legislation um, as to whether we support um, or against this legislation as it's going to directly impact our work um, long-term if it is approved. Thank you. So, um, I guess the office, if we can, let's try to keep track of that. And, and if, if it's a chance to follow up with the board members, that would be great. So I know you, you all will. So thank you in advance. Uh, Julia Colin Chung. Hi, thank you. 
Um, I'd like to let local parents know that applications, uh, the application period is open for the International Charter School of New York, where uh, my kids go to school and uh, where I serve on the board. Um, it is a diverse by design public charter school that uh, is opening its lottery uh, that will take place on April 1st. And uh, the school has had a um, a uh, large, uh, uh, much fewer than normal applications this year, and that may be because of COVID. And it may also be because people don't know that the school is working on a merger with Brooklyn Prospect Charter Schools, which is a very competitive school that uh, people do um, try very hard to get into, um, so that there is a pipeline for guaranteed admission into the Brooklyn Prospect Middle Schools, and then subsequently the high schools as well. So I'll put the applications in the chat for anybody who might be interested. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else um, doing open session? Mr. Chair. Yes, John. I just wanted to say, Mr. Chair, that the Brooklyn Public Library's um, efforts to put out the Christmas Carol virtually were a great success. Thank you. Moving on to uh, item number 12, other business. Is there any other business from the board members? From board members? All right, great. So before I move on to the next item, I thought I saw a friend of community board too, um, Sandra Rothbart. Did I see Sandra Rothbart on the call tonight? And Sandra, if you're on, I'd love to hear your voice. All right, so I'm not crazy. I'm almost positive I saw Sandra, but um, as many of you remember, she took a another job and had to relocate and so I wasn't sure if she was um, participating from her new location which if I'm not mistaken I believe is Australia if I'm not sure but um, in any case, Holland. Like, huh? it was Holland 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 okay Holland. different yeah, different okay. but any any case I'm hope hopefully she sleeps so <laughs> I'm glad to at least see her face momentarily. And so if anyone keeps in contact with her, tell her we said hello. And now I'm on to item number 13, motion to adjourn. So moved. I don't think I need any discussion on the motion. So good night. Thank you everyone for participating and have a great 2021. Look forward to seeing you in February. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.